JD Sports deny operating harsh <coughs> working conditions. Now a leaked document raises more questions about their operating practices. Good evening. Guidelines set out in black and white detailing harsh company practices have now been seen by this programme. Despite the JD Sports official repeated denials of hardline working conditions, the accounts given to this programme by over 100 workers at JD Sports support evidence we showed in our exclusive report last week. Tonight, the former business secretary, Vince Cable, adds to the criticism of the company. It's abundantly clear to me the way this company is operating, which is completely unacceptable and disproportionate and oppressive and exploitative its workforce. Also tonight, the manhunt for a 24-year-old Tunisian man continues all over Germany as fingerprints on the lorry used in the attack confirm his identity and Chancellor Merkel defends German security services amid accusations of deadly blunders. After five years of brutal conflict, the Syrian army declares Aleppo is back under their control. The last rebel fighters have left the city, but the war is far from over. The Amish of America famously shun television, cars, mobile phones, glitz, glamour and any hint of celebrity. So how come so many of them, like the embodiment of all the above, President-elect Trump? And the cost of menstruation for homeless women, beg, borrow, steal and a complete loss of dignity now someone has a solution. Also tonight, what does a great Shakespearean actress do when there aren't enough female leads to play? She plays male leads and curses the bard. We speak to Harriet Walter, who has recently come to a stage near you as Henry IV, Brutus and Prospero. One strike for wearing branded clothes, two strikes for using a mobile phone. This program has seen an internal document from JD Sports detailing these guidelines that its warehouse workers can face if they break company rules. Last week, we showed footage inside the warehouse of workers discussing the strike's policy, but the company categorically denied operating any such system. However, the document we've seen appears to contradict that. The former business secretary, Sir Vince Cable, Tells, this company, this, the, tells us the company's behaviour was disproportionate, oppressive and exploitative. Our North of England correspondent, Kieran Jenkins, has this exclusive report. Britain's biggest sports retailer is under increasing pressure tonight. Oh, it's more work. calls for it to explain its repeated denials of working conditions exposed by this programme as the evidence continues to mount. Last week we revealed the reality of working at JD Sports, at the warehouse that serves all its UK stores. Our undercover footage showed a strict disciplinary system that's drawn fierce condemnation. For all manner of minor security and safety infractions, three strikes and you could be fired. But JD Sports says what you're seeing is not its policy. What are the three strikes? Chewing gum, matches, lighters, mobile phones. A system described as twice as bad as Sports Direct. In public, JD Sports categorically denied operating a strike system, said there isn't one, never has been. Well, today we can reveal what we understand to be a document from within the warehouse, outlining each offence and guidelines for the number of strikes to be issued in each case. If that's not a strike system, what is? This document was apparently sent to senior managers at the warehouse in the last two years and is allegedly still in use today. Mobile phones in the warehouse, the document says, is two strikes. Branded clothing, one strike. Hoodies, one strike. Drinks and food, one strike. We showed our evidence to the former business secretary, Sir Vince Cable. 
Are you in any doubt that there is or has been a strike system in operation at that facility? Well, having heard the audible evidence on tape and having seen the documents, it's abundantly clear to me the way this company is operating, which is completely unacceptable and disproportionate and oppressive and exploitative its workforce. JD Sport says it has every confidence in its team at the warehouse and it stands by its policies, which it says are robust and fair, but they admit they could do better implementing them. The government, though, has already intervened. JD Sport's banned from recruiting to its warehouse at all job centres until it can satisfy the government it's treating workers appropriately. The company has announced a review to be overseen by its non-executive directors, but there is pressure on them to do far more. Where's the executive chairman, who earned £2.7 million last year? Peter Cowgill has refused all our requests for interview and refused to utter a single word of explanation. What do you make of the fact that the executive chairman of JD Sports has said nothing about this? Well, I think he should watch his step because we've seen what's happened to Mr Ashley and Sports Direct following their exposure. Uh, this appears to be as bad or worse if you have practices like this operating in business, then they, the company should be exposed and pressured into behaving properly. And I think that is now beginning, but the company are very slow getting their act together. Would you stop shopping at JD Sports? Well, I, I, I don't think I've ever shopped there, but I, having heard what I've heard today and seen what I've seen, I certainly would not. Since our investigation, we've received letters from hundreds of workers at employers across the country. Now, as you shop this Christmas, you may not have given them a second thought, but what they tell us is how powerless they feel and how this problem runs far deeper than many would care to believe. Don't forget that scandal hit Sports Direct. Profits sank over 50% in recent months. But JD Sports seems intent to tough this out. Kieran Jenkins reporting. Well, earlier I spoke to the former footballer Pat Nevin, who won 28 caps for Scotland across a 10-year international career and now works as a football writer and broadcaster. I began by asking him whether the Scottish Football Association should be looking into the working practices of JD Sports, which has an exclusive deal to supply Scottish football team shirts. I think it's a, it's a wider question. It's a question that's actually been around a lot longer than people think. Some of the biggest industries, the worldwide industries that have been working in sports, sportswear, strips, etc., they've had their problems in sweatshops from various parts of the world. So I always think it's quite a good thing when the media bring these things to our attention because pressure is then put on either sports clubs or associations or federations to put pressure on their suppliers. And then slowly but surely, that increases, obviously, the payment or the conditions that the workers have to work in. So it's, it's great that these um, stories are coming out. As a former chairman of the PFA in the union, generally a union man, I'm actually delighted it's up here now. Now for the SFA or whatever the FA is, I don't expect them to say we're not working with you anymore immediately. But I do expect them to put pressure on to have better working practices. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, these exclusive kit deals do lend themselves to the kind of abuses that you talked about earlier. There have been kit suppliers elsewhere in the world who've come up against these problems of sweatshops and the rest of it. Um, are exclusive kit deals a good idea anyway? Um, I, th I actually think that because plenty of them work actually quite well. So it's, it's a business. Now, I could go on rather a long time with the fact that I think we're generally in a gig economy that is abusing workers' rights anyway, and that's not just, you know, organisations that are manufacturing football. So that's people that are working for delivery companies, that's people that are actually going to have to drive 12 and 14 hours a day on scooters to hardly make the living wage as well. And to be fair, over the years, football organisations have actually generally been quite good at that. They don't spot it and they don't find it themselves. Quite often, it gets found out for them. But when it's found out, they tend to adapt sooner rather than later. All the issues around abuse, now the question of <clears throat> the manufacturing kit and the rest of it, is it any longer the beautiful game? I do think the football is in many ways a beautiful game, but I always think it's been a big, big business as well. 
they're very, two very, very different things. I mean, I, would, I say the abuse scandal is a, a much, much more serious issue to be dealing with. Um, a lot of it is historical, and you can't really point to football on its own. The one good thing out of this, the big, big thing, because it's such a newsworthy story in football, people have come forward and people are no longer scared to the same degree as they were to come forward. So in a way, even though football was harbouring it unknowingly, a lot of these people, it's actually a good thing that it came through football because that's where you get the biggest bang for your buck in the media and that's what's happened and I'm delighted for it. The more time that we can get players saying what they've gone through, the easier it makes it for other people and other organisations and other industries to come through say they were abused as well. So football can have its uses in good times and in bad. Pat Nevin, thank you very much indeed for talking with us. And if you work at JD Sports and want to contact us, you can email our investigations unit direct. That's c4investigations at itn.co.uk. Matt. Now, the family of the man suspected of the Berlin Christmas market attack has appealed for him to give himself up to police as the manhunt for Anis Amri intensifies. Police have confirmed his fingerprints were found in the lorry that ploughed into the crowd on Monday night, killing 12 people. And they've offered a €100,000 reward for information. Our correspondent, Darshna Sony, is in Berlin. Darshna, over to you. Three days on and the suspect is still on the run, now the subject of a Europe-wide manhunt. The Christmas market that was attacked here on Monday night has now reopened, but with the added installation of the concrete barriers that you can see. And that is hugely significant psychologically for Berliners who pride themselves in a love of freedom. And that includes a freedom from state surveillance. There are no CCTV cameras allowed in public spaces here. But there has been a debate about whether that should now change because it has meant there is no CCTV footage of the suspect. We now know so much more about him, 24-year-old Anis Amri. It seems that he was known not just to the German security services, but to the authorities in France, in Italy and in Tunisia. And as I've been finding out today, it seems that he took a path that so many young men have taken, from a life of petty crime, violence and drugs, to radicalisation. This is Anis Amri, filming himself on his mobile. The 24-year-old is now Europe's most wanted. German police, playing catch-up after initially arresting the wrong man, today raided several addresses across Germany. He is a man with multiple aliases, previously known to multiple security agencies, who avoided deportation because of a paperwork error. We can you know that we can report today that we have new information that the suspect really is, with high probability, the perpetrator. In the cab, in the driving cabin, fingerprints were found and there is additional evidence that supports this. At his family home in Tunisia, his relatives found themselves the focus of media attention. His brother told reporters they last spoke to him ten days ago and were shaken by news of the attack. I'm shocked like every Tunisian citizen who heard about it. When the police came to the house to take my mum, then we knew it was my brother, Anis. If he is watching me now, I just want to blame him for what he has done. A neighbour said Amri left Tunisia after being accused of theft at the time of the Arab Spring. Like hundreds of other young men, he entered Europe via the Italian island of Lampedusa. He was reportedly imprisoned for an arson attack and upon his release travelled to Germany. From petty crime to a circle of radical contacts, we now know more about the network he began to establish. Amri filmed himself on this street here in Berlin. It's in the multicultural neighbourhood of Kreuzberg, known for its hip restaurants and bars, but also known for its drug dealers. In Görlitzer Park, it's not long before we're approached by someone offering to sell us hash. Dozens of young immigrants, unable to work by law, hang around here. Anis Amri was often seen in this park. It's where he came to deal in drugs. In fact, he was observed doing so by officers when he was under police surveillance. 
We've been told that he had a reputation for getting into fights. Like so many young men who come to be radicalised, he had a background of drugs, violence and petty crime. There is tension here between African and Arab gangs. We met Mohammed, who told us he had seen Amri here in the summer and that he was known as someone not afraid to use a knife. You saw him in this park in the summer? Yeah, under uh, here. This is what we now know about Amri's contact with radicals. Police may have known as early as July that he was planning an attack. Investigators intercepted messages which suggest Amri offered himself up as a suicide bomber. The language was too coded for them to make an arrest. It's believed Amri communicated via telegram with IS fighters in Libya. Significantly, there are also reports that he was on the United States no-fly list. Concrete barriers going up around Berlin's Christmas markets, which reopened today. The new information about Amri has led to much debate here. Questions of immigration and integration, security and surveillance. Tributes are still being left for the 12 victims of the truck attack, including a 60-year-old Israeli woman who was here on holiday with her husband. Three days on and their killer is still on the run. Darshan Sony in Berlin. Well, from Munich in Germany is Peter Neumann. He's Professor of Security Studies at King's College London and joining us from New York later on, hopefully, Rukmini Kalimachi from the New York Times. But Peter Neumann, let's uh, talk to you first. Um, I mean, Angela Merkel went out of her way today, although she looked almost haunted, to defend the security services. But the fact that this man managed to slip through the net of the German security, the Italian security, perhaps the French security, is pretty embarrassing, isn't it? It is. Uh, I, I, I do not personally think it is the fault of any particular individual. Too many mistakes have happened. My hunch is that this is a systemic failure. Uh, you have to understand that Germans have not been used to this kind of terrorist attack. What happened in Britain in 2005 has never happened in Germany. And so I think in many ways we were quite naive about what it takes to fight terrorism. We never suspected, even not this summer, that it would ever come to us in the way in which it did. And so I don't think the structures work. There are a lot of problems with different states operating with each other, states operating with mm -hmm. the federal system, but also different services competing with each other. Now is it the fact, the rather sad and tragic fact, that a country in Europe needs a tragic attack like this one in order to get savvy about how to deal with extremism? I think that's the unfortunate truth, and it's not only Europe. Let's not forget that before September 11, 2001, the United States were not particularly good and were not expecting a domestic attack within their territory. In Britain, before 2005, the services were not ready to focus on jihadist terrorism. And, you know, in many ways, the debates that were happening after 2005 in Britain, I expect now to happen in a very similar way in Germany with all the good and bad that may be involved. Now, we've talked a lot in the last year about the imminent death of Schengen. I mean, this doesn't help Schengen, does it? When... Um, jihadists are able to slip across borders without being detected. Is this now the death of Schengen? Well, I hope it isn't, because the Schengen system has brought a lot of good uh, to Europe. However, just like with the euro, a system was created without thinking through the consequences. If you have open borders within a vast area and different countries, you also have to make sure that security agencies are cooperating with each other seamlessly, that they are yeah. exchanging data, for example. And right now, we have open borders in Europe, but we do have a number of different databases, and different countries are contributing to these databases based on the principle of, uh, of being voluntary. Right. So some countries are providing a lot of data, a lot of countries are not providing a lot of data at all. OK, stay there for a minute, Peter, and let's bring in Rukmini Kalimachi from the New York Times in New York. Um, welcome to the programme. I mean, you Thank wrote, you. I think, today that, um, although there's a lot of discussion about more surveillance, that people like this Tunisian suspect should have been surveyed more, more closely, 
surveillance doesn't always guarantee security. Now, why is that? We've seen over and over again that uh, in Europe especially, and also in America, people that were under surveillance, that were, that were being watched by law enforcement, somehow were able to slip the yoke and then go ahead and, uh, and, and carry out a terror attack. The Charlie Hebdo uh, shooters were under surveillance. Um, Amadi Koulibaly, who went on to do the Ypres Marche, uh, also in Paris, was under surveillance. Some of, many of the, uh, of the Paris attackers were on the terror list. What, what it means to be under surveillance is that these young men, and they're almost always young men, have been identified as being extremely radicalized. That's why they're put under surveillance. If they're already at the point of extreme radicalization, that likely means that they're in touch with the Islamic State or another terror group, and the Islamic State has become quite savvy um, at using encryption and using other means of camouflaging what they're doing so that they can escape um, the, the, the eyes of the law. In the case of the Charlie Hebdo shooters, uh, the way they did it is um, the, the brothers ended up using the cell phones of their wives mm. to communicate because they realized that their wives were not under surveillance, but they were. So is the problem here that we're simply dealing with too many potential suspects? There simply aren't enough eyeballs in the security services across Europe to, to look out after all these people? That's certainly what officials are telling us, and um, I, I do have some compassion for them, given, given the size of the problem now. There are so many uh, of, the, of these young people, um, especially in Europe, especially in France, uh, but also in Germany and elsewhere. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite a, a challenge uh, mm. for any nation uh, to be able to keep track of all of right. them. Let me ask you one other thing. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion politically um, and also in security circles about how much of a problem Angela Merkel inviting over a million um, refugees and migrants to her country has been in terms of security. And we know that this man arrived in Italy, supposedly, last year and then made his way to Germany. I mean, in terms of security, how much of a problem actually is it? I think that uh, what we need to keep in mind is, um, if, if I'm not uh, incorrect, more than a million uh, refugees have poured into Germany. Only a very small handful um, have gone on. It's, it's not even a handful. It's, it's really a fraction of a number have gone on to, to carry out attacks. Um, the Islamic State is grafting itself and piggybacking itself onto the refugee flow. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that the vast majority of the, those people are coming to Europe yeah. because of a real need, without, without any uh, terror motive. Now, even without the refugee flow, um, we saw that Abdel Hamid Abaoud, who was, who was probably the most hunted man in Europe uh, in uh, 2015, was able uh, to return to Europe, pick up his little brother, and uh, slip back out through uh, the country of Greece, uh, back into the Islamic State, mm. and then somehow return to Paris without, right. without anybody knowing, right? Um, and so be before the refugee flow even, even reached its height, uh, uh, terror, t terror suspects were using um, uh, that passage to okay. get through. All right, Rukini Kalimachi, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you very much indeed in New York, and Peter Neumann in Munich. Thank you both of you for joining us. John. Thank you. In the last half hour, the <clears throat> Syrian army says it has retaken the city of Aleppo after the four-year-long siege, claiming the last rebel fighters have now left. In a statement uh, read out on Syrian television, the military declared that the city was back under their control. <laughs> With the blood and sacrifice and heroism of our armed forces alongside our allies, the commander of the armed forces declares a return to peace in Aleppo city after it was liberated from the terrorists, after the last of them were evacuated. This victory is a strategic victory and a turning point in the war on terror. Over 35,000 people have been taken on convoys out of the city to rebel territory to the west and in nearby Idlib province. Their journey made more difficult by heavy snow and freezing conditions. Diana Magne has this report. A ragtaggle convoy drives out through the sludge. Cars, vans, anything that'll carry them out of the last corner of the city they fought so hard to keep. It is just the fighters leaving now, after 4,000 left overnight, limping out of what was once eastern Aleppo. It's very freezing. 
existing in the city, uh, the temperature are really, really low, which is uh, slowing a little bit the, the evacuation. In addition to that, uh, some of the uh, private cars which are uh, getting out of eastern Aleppo, they are in very poor condition. Uh, some of them were broken, uh, breaking down uh, uh, in the middle of the road and uh, all the, the, the convoy and the team in the convoy had to wait until they are fixed and to be able to transfer them to the western rural Aleppo. The Syrian Red Crescent are present along the way, but there's no international actor with any real capacity to monitor what happens to these men next. Many have gone to Idlib, which could be, in theory, the next Aleppo. So we have to look forward. And what is the reply to that? Two. The first one is make sure that the UN has not only access, and we will hear to that, but also the means, the capacity, the funding, for the winter. We are in the winter. But Idlib province is inhospitable not just because of the cold. Dubbed now in Arabic an open prison, there are 700,000 internally displaced who fled or been bussed here. And it is also Al-Qaeda territory, captured from Assad in March last year and now under the control of 14 different hardline groups, jihad their one shared bond. None of them too friendly with the more moderate end of the Syrian opposition, many of whom are now too scared to show their faces or to stay long in Idlib province. I have heard from all the guys, they are preparing themselves to cross the border into Turkey, where there will not be any of those guys who don't understand our revolution. Those guys don't accept the idea of democracy or dignity or anything. And Idlib has been bombed non-stop by Syrian and Russian warplanes while Moscow struck deals over Aleppo. Though some humanitarian aid gets through across the Turkish border, it's a place which offers little respite for the tens of thousands of new arrivals. Ever mindful of the powers who really call the shots in Syria, Assad today declared that victory in Aleppo was Iran and Russia's too. And in Moscow, the Russian president, in his annual meeting with his defense staff, was happy to take the credit. We can say with certainty that we are stronger now than any potential aggressor. Anyone. Despite the ugliness of Monday's murder of Russia's man in Turkey, this has still been Putin's year. Andrei Karlov's assassination, an act of vengeance for Aleppo, the gunman had said. But Aleppo has been the crowning moment of an air campaign which has swung the Syrian war Russia's way, and with it shifted the global balance of power ever further towards Moscow. Diana Magne reporting. The owner of a haulage company and his mechanic face long jail sentences after a 32-ton lorry with faulty brakes lost control on a hill, killing three men and a four-year-old girl. Matthew Gordon and Peter Wood were found guilty of gross negligence manslaughter after the crash in Bath last year. But the lorry driver was cleared of dangerous and careless driving. Here's Jane Deeth. Philip Potter may have been behind the wheel, but he wasn't to blame, the jury decided. Just that they've never not been in my thoughts, they constantly in my thoughts. Mr Potter had only been driving for his boss, Matthew Gordon, a few days. He wasn't interested in doing things properly. Mechanic Peter Wood didn't do proper safety checks. They put a lorry with lethal brakes on the road. It ended in this, a high-speed crash on a steep hill. Mitzi Steady, who was with her grandmother, was killed instantly. Her parents said she was outgoing and beautiful. Philip Allen, Robert Parker and Stephen Vaughan from South Wales were also killed. Six months after their wedding, Sean Vaughan became a widow. They denied, denied us of a family, um, something that we both wanted very much. We were only married for six months um, and especially having to spend your first wedding anniversary uh, alone was just so far removed from the one that we had planned. Um, it, it's just been absolutely horrendous. She blames the cowboys at Grittenham Haulage. That day, owner Matthew Gordon and Philip Potter were in convoy on a narrow lane that legally they shouldn't have been on. 
Philip Potter had been told to ignore an ABS warning light on his dashboard. As he tried to slow his 32-ton truck, six of his eight wheels didn't respond. When he went for the brakes, they failed completely. The handbrake was useless. He blasted his horn, but it was too late. He hit Mitzi Steady and her grandmother as they crossed the road before the lorry toppled over onto the car the three men were in. With carnage all around them, Matthew Gordon grabbed his driver and said, don't tell the police about the ABS light. What was uncovered was a truly shocking picture of a company culture with complete disregard of safety and maintenance. This was a company with a very casual attitude towards safety. Matthew Gordon and Peter Wood will be sentenced in the new year. The judge refused them bail, saying they'll get long jail terms and they should start serving them now. Some breaking news now. And while we've been on air, the Prison Officers Association says that 60 inmates have taken control of a wing at HMP Swaleside on the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. Well, James Blake is here with the latest. What is it? Well, Matt, this is a significant uh, and major disturbance at HMP Swaleside in Kent. We've spoken to the chairman of the Prison Officers Association tonight. As you say, 60 inmates, we think they've taken control of a wing where they've started lighting fires and destroying property. Now, this is a prison, a Category B men's prison, um, which contains about 1,100 inmates. There was an inspector's report there in July in the summer which ruled that the, the prison itself it described as dirty and dangerous, where the levels of violence, it said, was far too high. Now, the context of this, this is the fourth major disturbance at an English prison over the last two months. And you'll remember, it's just a week ago that 600 inmates Absolutely. were disturbed at a riot... Uh, uh, that were involved in a riot at Birmingham prison. Now, the, it comes on the day that the Prison Officers Association has overwhelmingly rejected an offer from the government over new pay and pensions. So that's the context of the whole thing. Thank you very much. James, John? It is hard enough being homeless, relying on food banks and charities for shelter, but many women are suddenly faced with what's called period poverty, struggling to afford basic sanitary products High Street retailers Boots have now started a new initiative encouraging customers to give donations. But campaigners want more big businesses to get involved, saying access to hygiene and sanitary products should be a basic right. Our health and social care correspondent Victoria MacDonald has this report. You've lost your home, your job, you've been beaten up, and then there is one more indignity. Women bleed. It's a fact of life, and they need sanitary products. But those in poverty, those who are homeless, often cannot afford them. For me to get access to sanitary products, um, I had to essentially beg and ask friends um, and family. Um, failing that, um, I ha you have to request with a food bank if you're female um, that you don't have access to these. And sometimes they may be able to include them within a food bank, but it's not guaranteed. Sarah, like many women who find themselves homeless, had to flee an abusive relationship. I was bleeding for over a month after I left my ex. Um, if my friends hadn't provided me with these products, um, then I wouldn't have had any and I would have been forced to use whatever I had available. The last thing Sarah had thought about was the cost of what many believe is a basic human right. You can either beg, borrow or steal, um, or some women are forced to put their lives in danger um, and use unsafe and unclean products um, from fabric to tissue paper to, you know, even newspapers I've heard some people have had to use, um, which is shocking and um, it's, it's fundamentally, it's dangerous. The beg, borrow or steal, indeed, is a theme in Ken Loach's latest film, I, Daniel Blake. Hi. Excuse me, madam. I think you've been shoplifting. Court shoplifting. The most basic sanitary product. Period poverty is hard to measure, not least because it hasn't been, until recently, talked about. 
but 26% of people using homeless services are women. And 5.1 million women live in poverty in the UK. For many, every penny and pound counts. In Parliament earlier this month, the impact on homeless women was raised by the MP Paula Sheriff. Sanitary products are simply unaffordable for thousands living on the streets, an issue raised by the campaign The Homeless Period. Could the leader commit to a debate so we can discuss ways to relieve degradation and embarrassment faced by thousands every single day? Yeah. The recently launched Homeless Period project has already led to Boots the Chemist encouraging in-store donations. But Laura Corriton, who also ran the End Tampon Tax campaign, says this is just a start. The original Homeless Periods uh, campaign wanted to see individuals donate um, to food banks and homeless shelters. So we thought like, to make that more sustainable, we'll potentially get like, big businesses and multi corporations to donate or to put in place donation programmes um, to help homeless people. But potentially the next stage is then to get government involved and if the government can then create their own donation programme. I hope in the future that basic feminine hygiene is recognised by the government as a human right um, and not stigmatised and classified as some kind of luxury um, at a woman's expense. Victoria Macdonald in that report now. Six Lithuanian migrant workers have been awarded a landmark £1 million compensation payout against Kent gangmasters after they were made to work on farms supplying eggs to some of the country's leading household brands. The men claimed they'd worked in filthy conditions, had paid doctor withheld and were threatened and abused by supervisors. It's the first high court case involving migrants who've alleged modern day slavery conditions and others could now follow suit. Here's Simeon Bryan. For years, this corner of Kent had a secret that Eastern European workers from Lithuania were being underpaid and severely exploited, doing work that looks like this as part of a chain supplying some of Britain's biggest supermarkets. We was treated like not humans. We don't had any rights. We don't had any choice. We been, if we not agreed, we've been sacked or kicked out on the street without any warning. We, we actually lived without rights. We was like animals. Jacqueline Judge and Daryl Houghton are the owners of the firm who employed Lawrence in 2012 as a chicken catcher. A landmark ruling found them liable for underpaying and withholding wages. This week, their company agreed to pay an out-of-court settlement, estimated at £1 million. But they did not accept liability. They were mistreated in terms of the, the failure to provide adequate facilities for washing and, and just basic necessities of eating and drinking. I mean, the more we heard about it, the more it was just extraordinary to us. And yet this was what these men had had to live through. The workers claimed that they had been trafficked to the UK before working for the Houghtons. The trafficked workers said they were moved from house to house and lived at several properties owned by the Houghtons. We know that this was one of the properties that workers described as appalling and overcrowded, which were eventually raided in 2012. These were the conditions inside. So what is the response of their former gang masters? Hello? Somebody appeared to be in, but no one replied. So considering the scale of the allegations and the size of their payout, we are still waiting to hear how the pair feel, since authorities labelled them the worst ever gangmasters. Hello? Is anybody there? The government has promised an additional £400 million to help supply faster broadband to more than half a million homes, after the watchdog found 1.4 million households don't have good enough access to meet the most basic digital needs. Our political correspondent Michael Crick is in Westminster now. Michael. Well, John, the, uh, the government's strategy over faster broadband is uh, while they invest more money through the telecommunications company, the co companies, the agreement is that those companies pay back money to the government when they sign up businesses and individuals. And so in, make, in making this announcement of an extra £440 million today, Karen Bradley also announced she was getting back more than £290 million 
from British Telecom. She did a round of media interviews, and it was Channel 4 News' first interview with her since she took the job uh, in July. So I took the opportunity to ask her about a couple of other controversial topics, uh, notably uh, our reports into uh, JD Sports, uh, which we uh, went on, uh, led with the programme on, of course, tonight, but also uh, the decision that Karen Bradley took um, a few days ago not to appoint uh, Althea Effenshile, a black woman who is the uh, former uh, Deputy Chief Executive of the Arts Council, not to appoint her to the board of Channel 4 after Ofcom had nominated five people for four possible places and chose four white men. But in our interview, I began with broadband. The government has done a programme through Broadband Delivery UK from my department to give four and a half million premises, that's homes and businesses, access to super fast broadband. And of those four and a half million, one and a half million have taken up the opportunity of super fast broadband. So that take up level, which is at 30% higher than 20%, than which was the minimum we were expecting, means that we get what's called a gain share. So this is money coming back from uh, the providers to local authorities so that they can roll out super fast broadband to harder to reach rural areas. That's 440 million pounds, 600,000 homes and businesses that will have access to super fast broadband who don't today. I don't know if you've seen our series on JD Sports. Your colleagues in the DWP have said that uh, JD, JD Sports jobs will no longer be advertised in their uh, job centres, but do you think that sporting organisations, local football associations and so on, should still be holding contracts with JD Sports? Do you think the time has come for a wider boycott? Well, I'm afraid I haven't seen the particulars of, uh, of, of what you're talking about, so I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment till I've uh, looked at this in detail. Well, the Secretary of State, who has a responsibility for sport, is not aware of the, the working conditions that we've exposed in JD Sports, which of course uh, follows exposés of, of working conditions in Sports Direct. Look, I think, you know, this is a matter for the Department of Work and Pensions and Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Uh, this is about working conditions and, as I say, I, I don't wish to comment without having further information. Why did you reject Althea Efonchile, a black woman, as a member of the Channel 4 board? There were four appointments that Ofcom, uh, that Channel 4 uh, advertised, that Ofcom advertised, and we appointed the four best people for those appointments. But doesn't it look bad if there is if you don't appoint a black woman to the board. I mean, after all, Channel 4 is meant to cater for people with minority interests and, and, and ethnic minorities and disabled people and so on. In the first two quarters of this year, uh, my department has made uh, appointments of which 50% have been women and 18% have been black and, and uh, minority ethnic. I'm very proud that we are achieving that level of, uh, of appointment diversity, but I don't believe we should have tokenism. I think what we need to have is the best best person for the job, but I am working hard to make sure that more uh, people from ethnic backgrounds and more women apply for these roles because we do want to get the right people into the roles uh, and make sure that there is diversity across the board. But surely it looks bad when you've appointed four white people to the Channel 4 board, but not a black person. There were four jobs that were advertised, there were very specific job specifications, and we appointed the four best candidates, most appropriate, most fitting candidates for those jobs. Karen Bradley, the Culture Secretary responsible for media, sport and much else. The US President-elect Donald Trump has hinted again at a temporary ban on Muslim immigrants entering the United States, claiming the Berlin attack showed he'd always been 100% right. Despite his provocative statements and allegations of sexual assault, Mr Trump has managed to win the support of the religious right. Among America's deeply committed Christian communities are the Amish, who deliberately shun the trappings of modern life. About a quarter of the country's 280,000 Amish live in Pennsylvania, many in Lancaster County, where Porrick O'Brien has been to find out why Mr Trump appeals to them. We arrive into Amish country as the sun goes down. Then dawn in another world. Daylight in a place that's different but familiar too. Nighttime atmospherics at an end. 
How did you vote? Well, I didn't vote. You didn't vote? Is that good or bad? I don't know, is it? I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. What was it about Hillary that you didn't like? Big feeling. Big feeling? Yeah. Oh, all right. A lot of us people don't vote. A lot of Amish people? Yeah. Some oh, is do. that right? Is it, oh, I see, okay. I mean, it's either his choice, don't matter. But, sure. You know, some do, some don't. A relatively small proportion of the Amish community vote in presidential elections, although anecdotal evidence that Trump mobilised more this time. An even smaller proportion are happy to appear on camera. Um, they've oh. asked us to stop filming and they've oh, have they? got a fork out. Oh, sure, Ron. We did eventually find someone to talk politics without pitchforks. Sorry, Ron, we've been told to go. <laughs> nice to meet you, sir. Ich bin ein Trumpfer. <laughs> That's how we'd say it. Ich bin ein Trumpfer. Yeah. I see. And are you? Just. Yeah, absolutely. Aaron Myers says Trump was perceived here as a social conservative, particularly around abortion. Also a dawning realization that after the financial crisis, even the Amish not immune to global forces. Family and business were at the heart of Project Trump, same as with the Amish. Do you think he's a decent man? Do you think he's a moral man? Uh, moral, in the, moral in the sense that he wants to do what's right. There's none of us, there's none of us that hasn't sinned. I don't think it's so much the person as it is the platform. People here were looking at Hillary Clinton who, you know, it seems to be that she had misrepresented so many things. And, uh, and Trump who's, who wants to, uh, in some ways, uh, take a step towards, for instance, making business better making opportunities for a small business. So for you, it was, it, it was something to do with a family businessman speaking right. to somebody like you, a family businessman. Right. Family, faith, plain living, what defined the Amish, but also their immigration story. Arrived from Europe in the 18th century with a non-integrationist worldview. Thousands came fleeing persecution, looking for a better life. Ring any bells? Is there a possibility that Mexicans and Muslims might have been feeling a little bit like the Amish did back in the day, hearing that sort of rhetoric? Yes. I think that with Trump, he said over and over again, it's not that they're Mexican, it's not necessarily that they're Muslim, it's that it's done the right way. You know, the Bible says, let everything be done decently and in order. There are other reasons for the Trump uplift here. They still talk about George Bush's visit, for example, 10 years ago, his folksy style, a big hit. But also the Republicans were organized on the ground this time. Is that, a, is that a vote Trump thing on the back of the thing, or is that just a... On the buggy. Yeah. It is. Ben King is ex-Amish, put up the billboards, ran the Amish pack here. We like freedom. We don't want to be told what to do. Culturally, that speaks at a very deep level to the Amish community. Yeah, absolutely. They want to just be left alone. Down the road in Hershey, Pennsylvania, the man who appeals to some in the plain living, soft speaking, world's most dishonest people, anti-vanity Amish community. We are just doing great in Pennsylvania. About to take to the stage. Go figure. <laughs> After the break, the actress Harriet Walter on being a woman playing a man. As Walter stars in a Shakespeare trilogy as Brutus, Henry IV and Prospero, we talk to her about the need for more female leads on stage. The actress Harriet Walter has played almost all of Shakespeare's female roles, but in her new book, Brutus and Other Heroines, she says that she's been starved of the bard for the past decade because he wrote hardly any parts for mature women. So Walter has taken on male roles instead, most recently Brutus, Henry IV and Prospero in a Shakespearean trilogy. I spoke to Harriet Walter earlier and began by asking whether she can, we can really blame Shakespeare for 400 years of misogyny. I'm very careful not to blame him. I, I, I write a sort of 
fantasy letter as I'm writing to an intimate friend who I've known for 35 years, saying, look, you know, I get it in your day. Um, it wasn't the done thing for women to act on stage. It wasn't the done thing for women to be in the center of the world stage. But now it is. Um, can you please lend your brilliance and humanity and insight and psychological depth to some new plays? And for you personally, was it just the question that you'd done all the great female parts and you'd literally run out of great parts to act in? Yeah, in one way it was. You, you, there was the ceiling right there. It was, it was as simple as that in many ways. So here you are playing Brutus. Yes. Um, and engage in some anger management that's not working out too Actually, well? Actually, no, I know exactly what I'm doing there. I'm saying I'm pledging to Rome. I'm saying, oh, Rome, I make thee promise that um, I will do this terrible oh, okay. deed so of murdering Caesar. It's a very solemn, earnest moment, yeah. yeah. Obviously, every role is different, but do you look for certain male traits and male body language, the things that blokes might do that women don't do? We, we did, we did sort of, it was more a question of censoring ourselves so that we didn't do anything too feminine, because in a funny way, um, our behaviour and gestures are rather additional, that, you know, to, to what our essence is. We've sort of trained ourselves to mm. sit like this, whereas men just go... Like that. Nice. Sorry, you're not. <laughs> what do you um, mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I did a lot of that. <laughs> I pride myself on my very elegant posture. Yeah. Politics is much less forgiving than the theatre. So you have Hillary Clinton, supposedly on her way to being the first yeah. female president, and she wasn't. Yeah. And she always got a hard time for either being too feminine or not feminine enough. What's I that all about? Well, I think one of the really difficult factors about women achieving things, which I write about in the book, is, is about this element of being liked. You know, um, people seem to need women to be soft, likeable, malleable, accommodating, and all the things that they need in order to get through, cut through and do what they want to do and achieve what they could achieve requires some kind of hardening and some kind mm. of toughing it out. And yet you had Margaret Thatcher who kind of used her feminine charms and was quite dainty and had her handbag mm. and nicely done hair, so she was very feminine in a traditional sense, but also hard as nails. Yes, I never you used that handbag. feminine. I, I mean, you didn't. Yeah. I found those are the outer trappings. She could have been a man pretending to be a woman, yeah. for all I was concerned. <laughs> now you're judging her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. Um, but yes, politics is different from playing, but, but you do get a great insight when you're playing as mm. to what is required. I almost think that, that gender prejudices are deeper rooted than um, other prejudices like religion or, or ethnicity race. or race. I think they go even deeper because everybody everybody has had a mother, <laughs> you know, everybody has an attitude. There's of course a great a great script, not written by Shakespeare, which you, which you played in. So, <laughs> <Jewaka. laughs> so um, why did you do that? Why, why the Star Wars? Well, what, wouldn't you? I'm very eclectic, actually. Mm. I mean, you know, I, I've done all sorts. I'm, I'm quite a sort of, um, you know, mostly um, open-minded, you know, as long as there's a challenge somewhere, and that was a challenge, you know, talking to a furry animal, that was a challenge. Mm -hmm. So you can have women playing male leads on the stage, but on film? It depends so much, because the point about Shakespeare is he doesn't specify what anybody yeah. looks like or what they have to be. But films are less forgiving. Films are less forgiving, and, and so it does need more scriptwriters who are interested in women for, the, for, for themselves, not just in as much as they relate to a man or yeah. want to get a man. And this is now out there in the agenda, at least, where before, 20 years ago, people weren't even talking about it. So imagine the Bard coming back and he's, he's in Washington just before the inauguration. He writes, he writes that great play about the, um, the demagogue who's trying to take over the democracy, mm. Donald J. Trump. Would yeah. you play Donald Trump? Would you play Donald Trump? I doubt whether Shakespeare would have anything to say about him. Well, he might I mean, do. I mean, he a... might make him into Caliban the monster. Uh -huh. Or, you know, I don't, I don't know whether he would um, make a coherent character out of mm. him because I don't think there is one there. And is Hillary Clinton a tragic figure for you? I think a, tr a tragedy has been revealed in that, you know, um, ultimately people were frightened of, of a woman. There will be others. Please, God, you know, um, of course there will. But okay. I think the world will get more feminine. Harry Walsh, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you.
Donald Trump intends to make William Shakespeare great again, I'm told, on good authority. We, on the other hand, will be back at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Good that night. is Channel 4 News. Good evening. Thank you.